Okay everyone, tonight we're going to take a look at network communications. And this is from Quinn's book, chapter 3. And this covers a variety of topics that we'll give an introduction to. And we've already talked a little bit about the internet addi addi addiction portion of this in class. Um, but other topics that we can cover in this introductory video are spam, internet interactions, uh, text messaging, censorship, uh, freedom of expression, uh, children and inappropriate content, breaking trust, among other items. So one of the important um, things to keep in mind is that network communications are just integral to our lives. We um, have a lot more than when I was growing up, right? Yeah, which was postal mail, telephone. Um, that was pretty much it. But then computers came along and then um, um, networks prior to the introduction the internet came along, CompuServe and Prodigy and America Online. Eventually those got connected to the internet and eventually those proprietary services went away and uh, we're left with the internet and cellular networks now. And they provide us with a large number of uses in our lives. I don't have to go into depth on this. You guys use all these sorts of different services um, from communications to just web searches to shopping, game playing, um, all these sorts of things. So, anyhow, and pretty much now, um, you know, far more people have access to cell phones, you know, and this is really a sad statistic, than they do electricity or uh, clean water, right? Um, you know, and really, how do most people get their news now? It's not from the nightly news broadcasts um, like it was even when I was kind of. Uh, growing up, right? You had the nightly news, you had the trusted anchor on one of the big three television networks, and that was pretty much it. Now we have 24-7 news cycles. Those are cable and satellite and, you know, online, and that's one way people get their, uh, um, get their news. Often those news services are biased one way or the other um, towards a particular political philosophy. Um, a lot of adults get their news from social media sources, Twitter uh, links or um, Facebook postings or Facebook groups, um, YouTube videos from various commentators, um, Instagram influencers, that sort of thing. Um, your book talked about in a 2014 survey, I mean that's getting a little long in the tooth now, that 78% of adults had used their smartphones to get news at least once a week, and 40% uh, of um, news from social media um, forty percent got their news from social media, and that was big because we had the twenty sixteen election, and I think social media had a big influence on the election one way or the other. And I think Republicans made a good effort in that election to, um, you know, um, just take advantage of what the Obama administration had learned in previous election cycles, about how they utilized the power of social media, and they were very effective with it. And I think each political party's effectiveness with social media is just going to continue to grow in, in the decades to come. We saw a little bit of this, how um, the Democrats kind of struck back against the, uh, the Republicans by uh, trying to take advantage of, um, oh, they were trying to do registrations for political rallies through um, WhatsApp or something like that, I guess, and I guess they co-opted that. I may be wrong about the app, but it was one of those apps. One of those ones that I don't use. So, anyhow, um, and obviously these platforms become a big uh, source of doing um, fundraising efforts, right? Oh, hey, Obama got 500 million from three million donors who contributed, right? It takes a billion dollars to run a presidential campaign, at least, so that's important. There was, you know, Ron Paul had four million in a single day from '07. That was a long time ago. Rand Paul, his son, obviously was the first presidential candidate to take Bitcoin donations, which is a little weird. But I, at the time, I guess now I don't know. Maybe it's not so weird anymore. Um, obviously, these figures don't show us how um, the internet and cellular networks support a desire to interact with others and accomplish a wide variety of of um, everyday tasks. Some folks try to sell us things we don't want or waste our time on activities, right? So, and that's sort of the genesis of, of this notion of spam, right? 
So spam is anything you don't want, right? We all get a lot of spam, whether it's phone spam or it's email spam or it's um, very in a very weird way. I've, you know, you get um, solicitations on on platforms like uh, Fitbit, saying, "Will you be my Fitbit friend?" Right? And obviously, it could be a social engineering hack, could be a way to do identity theft, perhaps. It could just be spam. They could be just trying to link you in to try to sell you something or get demographic information. It could be any number of cases. Anyhow, um, it's unsolicited bulk email, right? And there's 2.6 billion email accounts, at least in this world. 200 billion email messages are sent every day. The majority of it is spam, right? Uh, think about it. It, it costs um, $10 to send an ad to a million email addresses. That's pretty cheap. Um, if, if that figure in your book is still pretty accurate, right? More than 30,000 times cheaper than uh, junk mail, right? Because you have to put the f physical materials together. You have to get the postage. You have to buy the database from someone that has that information, right? And that's why the amount of email has ballooned from 8% in 2001 to 9% in 2009. As we kind of see on this chart here, right? Not spam. Well, actually, this doesn't show the percentage, it shows messages per day. You can see how spam has just absolutely exploded in growth, right? And, and during the aughts. And here, it, it, not spam grew at a very uh, much more linear rate, right? Um, you know, 10 billion, I mean, about doubled. You know, it wasn't a huge amount. Um, because of how fast spam grew, this kind of skews the graph on actual um, legitimate email growth. Um, and today, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood uh, from 09 to now, it's like 14.5 billion. If I saw that one figure, right? And that's huge, right? And it's just, it's amazing, right? Uh, there was a good thing about it. for 1 million contacts, 440,000 for the mailing list, uh, 280,000 postage at bulk rate, um, cost of the materials, right? You just think how expensive that is for a postal a mailing campaign versus just sending electronic mail and it becomes obvious even if your response rates are abysmally low about which path you're more likely to take right and and, and that's spam and you can do it from anywhere to anywhere in the, else in the world right probably target areas you know if you're from a low-income country that um, might want to target a higher income country right um go to where the people have the money so regardless of where that is so. all right um how do firms get their email addresses well there's a lot of ways right um you know you could just create a little uh program that scrapes websites and collects all the email addresses out of it and then you try to see if they're legit or not you could scrape uh, chat room conversations for email addresses pretty simple regular expression filter uh, obviously, newsgroup postings, right? Although no one uses newsgroups, um, so what's the modern equivalents like Reddit or Stack Overflow or those sorts of things? Um, obviously, sometimes computer viruses or worms can, um, uh, through APIs, uh, gain a access to phone books that are on individual systems, and then you know contact all those individuals and. Um, and then also send a copy of his email addresses back to the uh, person who wrote the virus worm. Obviously, anytime you enter a contest, there's usually um, conditions of that contest, right? And one of those is that they can resell your email address to third parties. Um, sometimes people just use dictionary attacks. They start out at a at domain.com and b at domain.com and c at domain.com and so on and so forth. And eventually you'll hit or cross the right combination of letters that corresponds to real email address. You log it and you build a database from that. Um, you could very quickly get like an Amazon SC2 instance, right? Uh, use Amazon's SES uh, melding service to make this all real quick. Um, all types of unsolic unsolicited solic solicitations um, all sort of stuff, right? Um, so most spam is sent out by bot herders who control huge networks of computers. Spam filters block most spam before it reaches users' mailboxes. Uh, the, you know, in the earlier days, um, 
they used these list of domains which they reject email from those weren't too good and they moved to Bayesian networks which provided better results and today you know probably there's combinations of Bayesian networks and neural networks at, at play in order to generate pretty effective anti-spam systems so. all right um, and here's an example of the Amazon simple email service right it's a cost-effective, flexible, and scalable email service that enables developers to send mail from any application. You can configure it to support several email use cases, including transactional, marketing, or email communications. Right? Mass marketing. All right. Um, you too can spam all of the institution that I work for for less than a dollar. Don't do that. Please don't. It's it's awful. They 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 get they get they have to put up with enough as it is. Um, so don't don't do this um, you know there is a need for socio technical solutions right um, and in in over time technologies have displaced categories of, of, of workers or replaced entire um, types of technology right um, and it causes new social situations to emerge, right? The emergence of calculators led to the feminization of bookkeeping because it came a lot cheaper to do bookkeeping. Um, and men who were seen as breadwinners um, couldn't exist in an industry that was experiencing essentially um, a shrinking workforce uh, set of requirements and, and stagnating or falling wages. So they moved on to other things and that encouraged females to come in. Is that a, a sexist thing? Yep, sure is. But that's that's kind of what happens at times. Um, doesn't make it right, just, it's just what happens. Um, and obviously telephones, um, you know, were another example here that the book kind of got into and it kind of blurred work and workplace um, and home workplace um, type of boundaries, right? Um, if I could talk. Um, we see this continue today with smartphones and electronic mail, all these things that kind of remote working, particularly with everything going on with the pandemic, has really blurred these boundaries. So we have to be really diligent about setting um, expectations and, 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 and using ca digital calendars and that sort of thing to really block out our times. When work time is work time, when home time should be home time. And unless you're in a position that really requires you to be sort of 24-7, you know, on the clock or you're, um, you know, you, there's a need for you to, to be responsive to sort of a paging type of situation. Um, you know, there definitely needs to be boundaries about when your workday begins and ends. Okay? And I would definitely encourage you to be adamant about establishing those boundaries and working for places that respect those types of um, workplace boundaries. So coming back to things, uh, spam is sort of an, an example of all this uh, this need for social technical solutions. Because email is almost free, um, there is a lot of profit incentive, even with very minuscule response rates, and that leads to a motivation to send more email, right? So we talked about some technical solutions to that problem. Um, and you know it, it has you know even if we can block it there's still the traffic volume that's created by it and then the internet allows for this sort of unfair one-way communication to take place okay. so you know the book talked about this case study with Ann she sent emails out to the co-workers about her daughter selling Girl Scout cookies right and we got into a few of these different you know you can get into a few of these different um, analysis in the textbook and we'll kind of leave these for classroom discussions um, you can obviously keep in mind uh, folks one of the things I noticed that when people talk about utilitarian analysis is they forget to quantify the analysis whether it's for dollars and cents or units of happiness or they use um, the more extended um, analysis to look at probabilities of different things occurring long term and apply that to their units of measurement that analysis does not tend to get done I know it's tedious it's tedious to use this type of analysis although it makes it a little bit more cut and dry if you can do so um, 
right? And they pretty much for this situation applied all these scenarios. So the the long and short of all this was that analysis reached different conclusions, but Anne could have taken a less controversial course, right? She could have did what most people just do at work. They put up something on the community dedicated bulletin board, and by bulletin board I mean an old fashioned bulletin board with the daughter's sign up sheet and you know, order your cookies, write down your name and all that sort of stuff. She collects the names up. So at some point kid brings in uh, the cookies, distributes them, not the not the parent, the kid, and then collects the money, right? You know, and, and unless the workplace is sort of a dangerous environment for a kid, right? It's a safety thing, then um, it should be okay. In this case, with an office environment, it should have been straightforward. Let the kid take the cookies around, collect the checks or the money, and that's probably how it should have done, right? Um, sending out the emails can be kind of an annoyance to folks, and generally speaking, there are, most places will have workplace policies against them. So. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, internet interactions. Um, Obviously, the web is our sort of killer app of our network communications world nowadays. Obviously, if you recall the text, Tim Beneers ben Lee um, created it when he was working for CERN, which was sort of the Swiss Re Research Center for Particle Physics, and they needed a documentation system. And the great feature of the web is its ability to link documents together through the, through the link, uh, use of hypertext links. And and obviously search engines, the, the popular ones like Google nowadays, um, index documents based on a number of other documents that reference it. You know, it was just a, granted a gross simplification of their very complex search algorithms, but um, that's essentially what's happening. And um, it creates um, for an incredible environment, right? There's been, you know, the web has the internet, you know, the, our modern internet that grew out of, you know, ARPANET and a host of other networks um, grew tremendously because of this particular application. And the web is decentralized and it's easy for everyone to get to. It was a huge improvement over previous documentation net, uh, systems on the internet like Gopher, right? And, I mean, Gopher has its charm, um, but it was just, it's, um, it's a poor implementation of, of a documentation system compared to the web. Um, just is. Um, let's see here. And obviously, they kind of go along with the web um, and our emergence of more portable devices um, has been the rise of the app, right? So we have these devices, they're very application centric. Um, they have ecosystems that are built around them. Um, these applications can obviously be designed in a way that they are sort of an envelope around a particular website or a part of a website. Websites themselves can be essentially applications, um, whether you do it on a desktop or a mobile device, right? And certain software development groups, um, architecture, uh, from an architecture standpoint, set up their web-based applications to either run on a desktop or um, to run on a mobile device. Um, the original iPhone, it was just envisioned that it would just use web-based applications, right? You go to sort of these web-like sites and it would just be a portion of that, right? And then obviously the App Store came along and native applications for Apple, it's iOS and Objective-C and all the APIs that go with Android, it's, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's either it's Java or Kotlin and, and, and they're, you know, Google, you know, their Google APIs with the uh, Google services and all that sort of stuff. And um, obviously there are progressive web apps kind of bringing us back to that, right? You can, you know, use development environments that will let you deploy to multiple platforms all at once, or you can do native application developments to tailor experiences. And in any case, you know, um, you know, the author says, well, using web browsers is awkward on mobile, device. and it is, it is kind of awkward to use the actual, um, mobile application, although Google nowadays requires websites to be mobile friendly and penalizes them from search results if they aren't. So a lot of sites are a lot better about being mobile friendly and about using um, security certificates to 
um, obviously provide um, a greater degree of privacy um, over those who might be listening in on conversations um, on the website. Obviously, DNS still isn't encrypted to a large extent, so there's still meta information leak, but um, it's um, it's definitely it's I, I you know it, there's this kind of um, fight right between sort of the balkanization of these native experience apps you know kind of walling off within a given ecosystem to a particular device and the website providing sort of this um, um, open um, decentralized experience right and um, in any case um, you know there was a time right there's this sort of back um, in in the late 90s the early aughts we had flash applications right and there was a worry that flash was going to take over the web and turn it into this system that had human readable documents to something that was all binary and closed off and wasn't really searchable and that didn't happen right mobile devices came up and there's some been this worry that native applications would kind of close off or de-emphasize the importance of the web come back along with progressive web apps and application architectures so I think the greater risk of balkanization of the web comes at a nation level, right? Countries kind of walling off their internets to a particular country, and we'll talk about that later. And I do believe um, the, the, the wall garden will occur at an app versus um, website toward sort of level. So, uh, anyways, uh, but, um, and obviously both ecosystems provide ways to have sort of these. Um, um, instant app experiences where you don't have to download a full app because it's always there's that friction right so you can go to a website it'll say hey i know you want to order a ticket or get a service why don't i download this piece of an app to your phone and make it real easy real simple straightforward don't even go through an app store do the thing and then if you want to you can later on opt to get the full application to get extra services downloaded so yeah so, and there's lots of uses of the internet. I'm not going to get into all of these. Um, so shopping, socializing, contributing content, blogging, crowdsourcing. You know, we'll take a, I guess we'll take a little bit of a look at some of these here in a second. Um, so, obviously, um, e-commerce is probably one of the bigger applications of the web, especially since it was possible to use the web for commercial purposes. And this is just a growth chart. Your book cited a much older uh, chart here. Um, this one shows uh, the growth of the internet through the second quarter, 2020, before the pandemic hit in force. And we can see that internet sales as a total of all quarterly retail sales is somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 16%, 15 to 16% of all sales. And that's pretty amazing, right? I mean, that's everything. I mean, that's getting gas, and that's getting your food staples, and getting all the sorts of um, other small little purchases that you do. And that includes people that never shop online, people that shop a lot online. And it's gone from 5% to, uh, you know, this 15 16% range. You know, that's pretty impressive. I think, um, and remarkable. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of places have one or two days shipping or even same day, you know, certain markets with certain companies, and that obviously helps a lot. Um, other play people are just willing to wait two or three days to get something. It's, it's okay um, because you get it at, you know, it's a lot easier experience to shop, and you can probably get a better deal on it sometimes. So, so obviously it's a usage. All right, so obviously um, I, I wanted to point out too here, because your book talks a little bit about the dark web. Um, the World Wide Web is sort of about 4%. And it's anything that you can search online, right? It's the pages you get to on your own. It's the stuff you get through from a Google search, right? 90% of the web is really, what, and I like this image, is really what's called the deep web, right? It's all the stuff that's in government resources, academic information that's behind walled gardens. It's medical records, it's description information, right? They're on 
sort of in, internet sites, right? And they're kind of walled off where you have to have an account to get into it, to get all this extra data and stuff. And, and that really is the majority of the internet. And then there's the dark web, right? And that's 6% of internet content. That's all the encrypted networks that need special uh, software to access it, right? Um, the you know the Tor network type stuff, right? And that's the dark web, and that's where you know, things take place, like stolen and illegal information, right? The sale of you know identity theft type um, information. Uh, drug trafficking takes place, illegal sales, so on and so forth, right? Um, a number of years ago, there was this popular website on the dark web called the Silk Road. It was an anonymous market, right? You could order your drug of choice and have pay in some, you know, digital currency of some sort or another and uh, and have some drugs uh, appear on your doorstep like it was an Amazon-type website, right? And obviously that got shut down by the authorities after a period of time. And there's probably some good documentaries behind it and all that good stuff. But that pretty much was what it was. So there you go. All right. And then obviously, um, ancestry type stuff is uh, important. And, um, you know, tra 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 um, tracking your roots and all that good stuff. And um, understanding about, you know, where you came from, your ancestors. It's, it's real heartwarming stuff. I think it's, it's pretty cool stuff. And I'm going to temporarily turn off. I, if I was shown this in class, I would show the next slide with some information myself. But I'm going to turn that off right now, temporarily. Right. And I'm going to get through that slide. Okay. And I'm going to turn that back on. Okay. Obviously, another application is that of gaming. Right. Oh, and this is obviously Fortnite, and this is a. Uh, Multiplayer game, you know, uh, Battle Royale is the game mode that they call this. And, you know, a bunch of players go in, they collect a bunch of digital assets, they try to eliminate the other players, and one person ends up victorious. Right? Um, you know, this is one type of game style. Another type of online gaming, I wouldn't call it a gaming experience, it's sort of a social experience. Um, is a per, or they call it persistent online game i think is what your author referred to it as in this case a player assumes the role of a character in a virtual world and then attributes of the character in the world persist on beyond a, a particular gaming session unlike fortnite so world of warcraft was mentioned by quinn um, as one example of that right you take some role on and you go and you you know collect coins and you know, go on quest or whatever it is um, this is another one. This doesn't have like quest per se as goal, right? But this is uh, another, um, and I wouldn't even call this an online game. This is more of a social experience environment or ch a social chatting environment, I guess, called Second Life. Um, it was very popular probably, you know, 20 years ago, I would imagine. Uh, 15 years ago, maybe? Something like that. I think it fell off after about 15 years ago. I I'm sure there's still some that use it to some extent. Um, but, um, it was, you, you could, you could use it for, I guess, just, well, meeting with others and as a 3D avatar character, right? So, anyways, um, obviously, um, Internet of Things, right? All sorts of different applications, thermostats and appliances and lights and motion sensors and door locks and cameras, right? And this represents, a uh, a snapshot or digital thumbprints of some of the cameras uh, surrounding my home. And, um, you know, it obviously provides a peace of mind that I know that I can, when I'm away from home, be able to see my surroundings and get notifications of events that cause my cameras to trigger. That's great. Obviously, there's uh, crowdsourcing um, of different types. Your book talks about Kiva, which is a human action type of website where you can provide loans to individuals in um, various types of countries where micro lending makes sense um, where for these smaller contribution amounts you can actually help someone get started in 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 in, 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 in bootstrapping their business 
and um, can help them lead sort of this uh, an independent uh, life and it's great and um, seems like a, 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 a good cause to support so you know entrepreneurship I think is, is a great thing and if you're in a position where you can provide these micro loans and get some of these folks here um, started on their businesses um, that they kind of have a passion for I think that, that's a great thing okay text messaging all right obviously we all text message to some extent or another I, I love to use my Google Hangouts um, uh, such as it is these days um, link to my Google Voice number and I can text from my phone my desktop um, it all links together it's all searchable it, it works really well I like it immensely right um, obviously um, as sort of an intermediate technology and really to an extent still to this day uh, there are some services in, in various countries around the world where text messaging um, is necessary because of the lack of inter internet infrastructure and, and high-speed communications and your book talks a little about M-Pesa in Kenya all right and I, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that um, service to help save money pay bills transfer funds also probably because the financial networks particularly in more rural areas I would I would suspect isn't as sophisticated as they would be in more urban areas um, help with communicating information about crop prices help them protect against uh, counterfeit medicines that sort of stuff so it's a good part of the chapter to read up on and I encourage you to do that uh, Twitter obviously social media is a big use of our internet right I love Twitter it's a great service um, social networking service 200 million users at the time this book was published there's probably more I bet it's probably closer to 300 million a bit um, blogging tool um, to biz, uh, micro blogging tool. Your book calls it a blogging tool. It is technically a micro blogging, right? Because, well, it was 140 characters originally. It's 280 now. Um, if you want to do a true blog, you want to actually write a true blog, use an actual blogging service such as they exist even before Twitter came around. And, uh, you know, like Google's Blogger or WordPress or any of those other types of blogging services for long format blogs. Obviously, "Quote unquote micro blogging services, um, such as you know the um, Chinese equivalent to Twitter, whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, they're you know Chinese so, you know allows is language that allows for a lot more um, verbosity and a limited number of characters because of how that written language is constructed. So within a micro blogging format, you can actually say a lot more. It's 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 as much um, it's a much richer um, density of information, right? So versus you know our our English um, character set, our Latin character set, right? So anyhow, but Twitter's been a big tool and to businesses being able to promote themselves and um, and helping the the spark particular political moves such as the Arab Spring. Um, I remember being in Egypt uh, a month before Ar the Arab Spring events uh, rolled through there when the thought a thing in the world was wrong in Egypt had a great time um, touring throughout the country had no clue um, that, that things were going to go so south so quickly in there um, and that and that you know and that Mubarak's uh, uh, reign was about to end so um, so social networks do help lead to politicization um, Some might say it doesn't really help to promote long-lasting, long-term, um, high-risk type active, active, um, activism. Um, it's debatable. Um, I, I think it's had a, I think it's had an effect in causing extreme politicalization on both the left and in the right in this country um, much to our detriment um, um, it's I think had a adverse impact yes people get their voices out there and you know people um, are able to advocate their political positions and it's helped in terms of freedom of expression and speech and all that good stuff um, but in some cases, I think uh, people have just become more politicized. They don't try to be um, 
empathetic of others' positions and try to work at finding sort of common ground. And that's a shame. It really is. All right. So there's my little Twitter account. All right. All right. Censorship. All right. So censorship is something that's existed throughout history, right? Uh, and there's three different types, government monopolization, uh, pre-publication review, and licensing and registration uh, are the three major forms of direct censorship. So for the first type, you know, government monopolization, you know, Soviet Union is a classic example. They owned everything, all the TV stations, the radio stations, newspapers, right? And with nothing got passed without the government censors approving it. So they controlled the entire message. Um, you know, it's still the case in North Korea, right? That, that situation still exists. Um, private organizations, you know, in places like the Soviet Union back in the day couldn't even own a photocopier. So, because that could lead to a situation where folks could get their own opinions out there that may be contra contradictory to what the government uh, stated position on something should be. Um, obviously, number two is pre publication review. This is one we have in this country. It's very necessary because we have a you know a defense department and we have you know other law enforcement agencies and a need to keep certain amounts of information at various levels of confidentiality all right obviously the stuff in the defense department speaks to state secrets and we need to protect state secrets we, there's certain information we couldn't let, uh, let out because our enemies would get a hold of that and might use that against us right and um um, it can be abused though, right? Number two can be abused, um, right? L political leaders may um, try to use it to block embarrassing material on themselves or their colleagues. Um, you know, so there's always a balance to it. Um, number three, licensing registration. That's necessary um, from the standpoint of you can't have different you know, television stations or radio stations or other broadcast medium, um, uh, folks stepping over one another and, and, they're in, in, in sending something out on the airwave. Now, generally, there's a policy um, for how you establish licenses and all that good stuff and regulations. And, you know, government agencies can exert some control over that, right? Um, and keep folks from doing certain things, right? And, and yeah, it's, it's, Part of that is to keep folks from broadcasting in parts of the electromagnetic spectrum they shouldn't. The other parts of it, too, is to provide for the public good, right? So the FCC doesn't let um, public um, broadcasting entities, um, or private, you know, I guess, broadcasting entities, in short, um, say certain words, right? They can't use the seven naughty words on the air, and there are certain contents that are not appropriate for kids to be shown during primetime hours, right? They've had all these sort sort of rules for a long time. And um, I think it's reasonable to have those expectations in place, right? It's not cutting off folks from getting certain types of content if they really want to. It's just um, providing a, a family-friendly environment in which to have broadcast, right? So that people aren't unnecessarily exposed to things that might be harmful to them, particularly for children, right? So when they're at, at a, a, a malleable age. All right. So self-censorship is the most common form of censorship, right? Um, you know, groups will decide not to publish for a, a variety of reasons, right? Um, sometimes, um, you know, they're getting sponsorships from certain groups and they may not want to publish. The, not to um, raise the ire of um, the sponsors, right? Um, you know, um, sometimes folks decide to self-censor because they don't want to suffer the loss of a job or they don't want to suffer the loss of the respect of their colleagues or um, society in general, right? Um, Sometimes certain individuals in certain countries may decide not to publish something because to do so may cause them to run foul of, um, you know, of, say, um, um, 
you know, religious laws, right? Where you can't say something against a particular uh, god or a prophet or something like that, right? I could get you arrested for heresy and you could get convicted and you could be imprisoned and fined and or put to death or, you know, whatever it is. So you may not say certain things because of that. All right, sometimes um, journalistic agencies will decide to self-censor because, um, you know, it could put others in danger, right? So 2003 Iraqi invasion, um, you know, there were some groups there that um, decided not to say something because they were embedded with um, troops, right, that were moving through Iraq and stuff. Uh, but there also, Quinn, Quinn got into this in his book. He talked about the CNN borough head in, in Iraq um, Eastern Jordan, who admitted that they had suppressed negative information about the uh, the Hussein um, government, right, um, to kind of keep the news bureau running and to keep the people who worked there, particularly the Iraqi citizens who worked there, safe. So, you know, you can debate whether or not that was an ethical thing for them to do. They felt it was the pragmatic thing to do, though. Um, at the time so and obviously we have rating systems right so we rate all sorts of content tv cds video games we usually don't have um, um ratings for websites there you know people had proposed things throughout all the years but nothing really stuck because um it just it just didn't um speak into the free willing free expression free speech um, nature of the web, I guess. It just was never widely adopted. I think today the best way to do um, um, self-censorship for the web is to uh, um, redirect the DNS um, servers that you use on your internet service to sites that can provide that appropriate filtering. So, and that should be a personal choice of, of the family unit to do so. Or of the, of the business, of the institution, the organization to do so. So what are the challenges uh, posed by the internet? Well, there's a lot of them. Um, there's this sort of um, um, many of the many communication, um, dynamic connections, right? Huge numbers of websites that you know, you'll never reach the end of the internet, right? Um, you know, sometimes people can do things that extend beyond the national borders of various countries, make other countries mad, right? Um, you know, the internet's huge, but there are country-level firewalls, and some countries like China have made these things very effective. And they threaten to kind of balkanize the internet, kind of bring everyone back into their national borders again. Which is kind of a, it's a sad loss, but it's, 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 you can understand it, though, too. Um, you know, um, you know, yeah, you can't shut down every physical newspaper, radio, uh, every what you can't shut down every website. You could shut down more easily newspapers or radio stations or TV stations, right? Especially within a country, you can't shut down every website, and um, that's why countries have established these nation-level firewall systems, essentially on on the networks that connect to the internet. And like I said, China has gotten very effective with being able to monitor and close off this traffic. Although you can see various TED Talks or various groups, and they talk about the ways that they can get around these restrictions, right? Obviously, they could use VPNs to go directly to various websites, but they could also um, use their own internal social networks that talk about sensitive issues um, in a coded manner. And to a large extent, those uh, some of those regimes, such as in China, allow folks to get with a way to that as long as they're not inciting violence or something they're just there and they're blowing off steam about the situation they do it in a coded way generally speaking they'll look the other way on that so but not always i mean there's always exceptions right so um there's just a culture and you have to understand the culture in which you operate um Obviously, another one of these issues is that it can be hard to distinguish from minors and adults, particularly when it comes to adult-oriented material, right? Um, we talked a little bit about this in class. I mean, what are your options? Your options are provide an ID. That's a potential privacy violation, but it is one way of doing it. You validate the, the ID itself. Provide the person accessing the site and the ID provided are the same thing. I could 
uh, have someone take a you know picture of themselves with a web camera again it's a privacy issue and they could just put a picture up there and try to fold the camera right there's always ways to defeat it um, but it's a privacy thing particularly if it's a kid and generally speaking people under 18 even if they're trying to do something naughty um, are not able to provide informed consent right so you know asking them to give that picture could be a violation of various legislative acts right even if you use a neural network try to term kid not kid right sort of thing so we have to be we have to just realize it's a hard thing to do right credit cards obviously same thing right kick get dad's or mom's credit card and just put in and, and just to verify access to a website there's all sorts of limitations again that's why i think at the end of the day when it comes to things like that it comes back to having strong families strong family units involved um you know parent or parents that um and and as a technology professionals with providing people with choices and easy to use choices um that allow families to determine the best way to kind of run their families right so anyhow um right and obviously north korea is a place where the internet's vir virtually inaccessible except to those with party affiliations um there is a north korean internet of sort there's some videos out there it's a, it's, a, it's a handful of websites that are basically like a very large internal nationwide intranet um, obviously top party officials can still uh, get access to the real internet via china and do things that are necessary for north korea to establish their various policy directives with the rest of the world obviously saudi arabia has a very centralized control center and firewall type um, scheme probably not as effective as china's but it is there um, I think they were, but Saudi Arabia was pretty early. They pretty much started to control all this stuff back in 99 um, with a control center in Riyadh. And, you know, they, I don't know what technologies they use these days to block things, but it was probably the usual use blacklist sort of things to block porn and uh, gambling sites and other sites that were probably deemed of offensive to Islam. Um, but that also probably blocked a whole host of other websites, right? um you know like uh christian websites right or women's health and sexuality websites or you know um sites related to certain music or movies right or um gay rights movements that sort of thing um particular middle uh progressive middle eastern policy uh politics related blogs or something i probably got blocked um and how does circumvent filtering i would imagine um, obviously, China has one of the world's most sophisticated versions of these types of networks. And we're not privy to the technologies that are being used, but you can imagine it's a combination of things, right? You know, from, again, from Bayesian networks and blacklists to handcrafted exceptions to, um, you yeah, know, I guess blacklists are kind of that, right? To, um, to maybe probably usage of uh, various neural networks these days you know and other types of uh, um, nuanced ai type applications um, and you know this is nothing new germany uh or you know germany does it too um they forbid access to neo-nazi websites right obviously they have a you know from world war ii um german people are very sensitive to that sort of thing because of the harm the the, the nazi party and and more in 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 the nazi movement inflicted upon upon jewish people back in world war ii right so they're very sensitive to that and how that impacts people today and in the united states there's been repeated efforts to limit access of minors to pornography because of the harms that um that that access can you know um create in minors right and um it's it's a tough issue to deal with Right, and obviously there were a few acts there was the book talked about the communications decency act the child online protection act the children's internet um, protection act uh for the first two of those were obviously not upheld by the supreme court the third was limited effectiveness probably and again it comes right back i think the best way as a, as a parent as family as certainly i will do with my child is i will provide um uh, technological filtering solutions 
in discussions um, with, with my kid on this on these sorts of topics and why as a kid you shouldn't access certain websites um, you know at a you know at a level that's appropriate for the kid and monitor the kids you know computer internet usage is appropriate so and hopefully my my kid will make good choices all right so there's a various ethical perspectives on censorship um, obviously um, can't uh, oppose censorship you know the alignment was sort of a reaction to institutional control um, a thought from the aristocracy and the church um, Kant was really big and you applying sort of common sense to the issue and being able to kind of be able to think for yourself about um, various topics right so he thought that people should be able to exercise their own reason right um, and that these restrictions should be removed so that they could do so he thought censorship was just a backward step right mill opposed censorship and no one's infallible and any opinion may contain a kernel of truth right um, now would be a great one but it's there um, truth is kind of revealed in a class of ideals and in that discourse is very important to have um, he believed that good ideals would prevail over ones that were just terrible um, you know he would definitely have been a supporter of Twitter's earlier beliefs in their early days that, that they were the uh, free speech arm of the free speech um, group on the internet they, they had a phrase I don't, that, that wasn't quite it but they were very pro free speech right and I think Mill would have been a supporter of those early views of Twitter and obviously Twitter has reined in on some of those opinions over the years um, probably to a positive impact right they're a private business they can choose how much free expression and free speech they want on their platform as a private business um, you know I think people get this mistaken belief that they should always have access to free speech on any platform and no you, you don't get that because those are private businesses all right so all right. All right. and then of course Mills had this sort of principle of harm the only ground on which intervention is justified is to prevent harms to others the individual's own good is not a sufficient condition right so in other words the government should not get involved in the private af um, affairs of individuals even if those individuals are doing something to harm themselves right so he would have been obviously a libertarian from that perspective right so libertarians think you ought to have the right to engage in any uh, type of drug use personally that the government shouldn't be involved in that that you should be able to engage in any particular um, sexual activities that you, you prefer and that's that and the government has no business going into the bedroom you know or has no business interfering in the substances you put into your body right and so on and so forth right or getting involved in your businesses that sort of thing um you know financial you know your like work businesses that sort of thing um or if you gamble or not or you know what types of music or videos you um consume right so um so according to mills you know you know you know like for example with pornography adults um, consuming pornography that involves adults would be fine um, but with mills um, obviously pornography involving children right and, and and pedophilia type activities would not be good because that obviously involves the harm of another party right obviously kids can't provide informed consent um, so that would be one area obviously if adults themselves were um, inebriated or were too high to provide consent that would be an issue um, never by that you know, that that's a harm and that would be a case for the government for intervening um, obviously there are people that have various cognitive impairments for various reasons um, whether it's genetic or they're more elderly or something like that and they cannot again provide consent so any harms to them whether it's with, with pornography or with some other activities in life 
um, obviously has to be something where the government gets involved because um, in because those individuals are being harmed, right? And I think most of us can agree that any of those things where someone is being harmed is an area where the government ought to be able to get involved because those people aren't able to um, defend themselves. They aren't able to um, be aware of, of the of the um, of the damage that those actions are having upon them, right? Um, so it's 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 one area where we need to make sure that there are laws to protect vulnerable populations. Hmm. So freedom of expression, right? It's one of our most cherished rights in the Constitution, right? It's in our First Amendment. Um, obviously, this has a long history, um, going all the way back to the 13th century with the de scandalis magnetum, right? Which is basically you couldn't say anything that was offensive to the crown, right? And there was the Court of the Star Chamber that was established, and that dealt with cases involving, you know, libelous or slanderous things, you know, um, against the crown, right? And there are all sorts of imprisonments or other, you know, punishments that could be, you know, given out for, for those sorts of things. And obviously that persisted till the 17th century and then the common courts in England took that over. But obviously this whole, you know, say nothing bad about the crown or later on you know, also justices persisted into the era of the American colonies. Obviously, you know, uh, 50, uh, the book said some like some 50 colonists were prosecuted and convicted of that. So obviously that le left a pretty bad taste in colonists' mouths that for people that were kind of having to go at it on their own and develop this very independent mindset living far away from England. So once we gained our freedom as a country, we made sure it was, um, it was in a lot of states' rights, right, under the Articles of Confederation. And then when we switched over to the Constitution, groups really advocated that we include a set of, uh, uh, of amendments, at least, um, where the freedom of expression would be protected. So. And the other thing about that Star Chamber go back is that the conventional rules of evidence weren't, weren't a part of it. So um, it could probably become What's the term I'm looking here for? Um, kangaroo court, right? And I'm sure it was probably a kangaroo court at times. So obviously um, our constitution and, and our freedom of expression is, is a much better situation nowadays. So, right. And it just basically says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free the exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble. And, and I like to emphasize that word peaceably, right? It's not a right to go rioting and destroy things and harm people. It's a symbol, state your case. Yeah, you can shout at the other groups and stuff, but um, that should be the extent of it. And to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So the First Amendment covers political and non-political speech. Why non-political speech? Because, well, one, you can't make a distinction all the time between what's political and non-political. I, I certainly would not want our justices doing such a thing. And non-political covers other areas, scientific thought, um, artistic expressions, right? Even if those are things that I find highly offensive, right? I think for a lot of Christians, they would find stuff like the maple thorn exhibits to be highly offensive. Um, flag burning would be highly offensive to um, conservatives and veterans, right? And we don't tend to, you know, appreciate um, those expressions, right? But we have to let those expressions stand. In this country, we, um, we allow neo-Nazis and, and far-right groups and far-left groups to exist, right? Um, whereas in other countries they may not be able to exist, right? Neo-Nazi groups can't exist in Germany, for instance. So, and they can here. And we may not like it. Um, we, um, we, we do have to, we do have to allow it to exist, right? Now, businesses sh shouldn't support real extremist elements, I, I don't think so. Um, obviously shareholders and 
should hold them accountable for that sort of stuff. Advertisers should hold, should be able to have the right to hold, you know, gr um, you know, groups responsible. Um, you know, if there's if they're, if they're on a, you know, a, a private platform that's, you know, you know, showing some of the stuff, right? So um, now, obviously, if it's a public forum, that's different. If it's a public sponsored forum, that's different. Um, than, than a private one. So, all right. Um, you know, keep in mind that freedom of expression. Um, your book talks about and references um, Francis uh, Canavan and freedom of expression. He, he and there it was noted. Perp, um, uh, purpose is limit. I think was the title of the thing. Noted that that freedom of expression does not allow you to use liable. Doesn't allow you to be reckless or, or, or calculated with lies. Doesn't allow you to use slander, misrepresent things, uh, engage in perjury, engage in false advertising, um, use of obscenity and profanity. Although that's probably the um, the weakest area, right? Of, of, of area that people disagree to a large extent on what may constitute an obscenity or profanity. Although I think the one Supreme Court decision is it's based on. Um, local interpretation and sort of the you know it when you see it sort of thing all right standard um, the solicitation of crime obviously is not covered by the freedom of expression and obviously personal abuse or fighting wars right and making threats against others that sort of thing and your book talked a little bit about this case with Jeremy, Jeremy James I'm not going to get into it right now um, there was this other thing, obviously, with the FCC versus uh, Pacifica Foundation, right? So back in the 70s, George Carlin, who's a comedian, or was a comedian, um, published this uh, uh, record, I guess, called Filthy Words. And uh, this, uh, this little radio station in New York uh, published, or re not published, replayed this particular record. Um, Dad with a, with a kid heard it. And filed an objection with the FCC. They put a declaratory order, put in their permanent record for licenses renewal, told them to stop it. There would be sanctions if they did anything more. They specifically sued. They went to court, made it all the way through the Supreme Court, 5-4 decision. Um, they basically said, you know, broadcast media is uniquely pervasive and it's uniquely accessible to children. There isn't any real easy way to cut them off from it. And there's no way to, even if you say, hey, there's some offensive stuff coming up you may want to turn off. No, really, you may want to turn it off. This is your last warning. You may turn it off. You need to turn it off. Even that is not sufficient to um, protect against children being exposed to harm. Now, we do it on the Internet all the time. You know, people on Internet videos and private video sources like YouTube or something like that will do that all the time, right? They'll say something bad could be coming up. I'm warning you now about it. And, but that's a private platform. Um, uh, you know, it, those broadcast mediums like radio and TV are, are public ones, right? They're publicly accessible. And, you know, you know, it's possible for someone to be exposed to it even for a few minutes and a harm has been created. So that's why that decision was reached. Right? So, again, I just want to mention, as a, as a parent, as an organization, you have options, right? You can... Now, obviously, there's different enterprise solutions for this stuff, but as an individual, right, with your family unit, you can use OpenDNS, which Cisco now owns, to configure, set up an administrative account, right, with the DNS, and set up which categories to block or open up, and works just fine. Obviously, Cloudflare recently introduced a, a 1.1.1 1 .1 .1 .1 1 for families, right, DNS type service. It's a little bit more limited. It's malware. Or pornography. Um, I'm not sure if you can get an account and configure that. I haven't looked too closely into it, but it's an option. And there's other other software products out there that can help you out with that too. So, yeah. and obviously there was this sort of case study on Kate's blog, right? And she had this blog, and she was attending a party with someone that was one political party. As a joke, they made him wear a T-shirt of another political party. Uh, Kate took pictures of this individual without that individual's consent and posted. It was later removed. It created some ill will, but then they both became popular because of it. I guess an anti-Streisand effect. Right? And 
Kantian analysis would say that it was wrong because someone was used as a means to an end. Social contract theory was saying it was wrong because it violated you know, his right to privacy. And equitarian analysis would say it was okay because they both got a benefit out of it in terms of units of happiness more so than harm. And that was, generally speaking, in the short term. Long term, it was harder because he did attach probabilities to it. All right, so rule of deterian analysis looked at the scenario by saying, you know, positive consequences, you know, versus the negative consequences from based on the question of what if everyone were constantly taking photos of people and they encounter and posting them. Um, now this was in a private setting, I believe, right? Okay, so you know, that's a little different from being out on the public street. Um, people would have more opportunity, the positive consequences, people have more opportunities to keep up with what their friends are doing. People might be more reluctant to engage in illegal activities as positive outcomes is. Negatively, uh, people would be more self-conscious because people keep taking pictures of them all the time. That's why people reacted so negatively to the Google, glo uh, Google glo uh, goggles or glasses. No, Google glasses when they came out. Right? And some relationships would be uh, harmed. So negative consequences are more weighty than the positive ones. So really a satirian analysis would say that was not ethically um, a good choice. All right, and in virtue ethics, again, would say um, would not be good because neither of them were um, embracing reciprocity or equality, right? So Kate shouldn't have did this. All right. So children and inappropriate content. Well, we have web, web filters. They can help us prevent individuals from going on certain web pages, right? It could be installed on the PC, it could be installed on routers, um, dedicated firewall appliances that are on the network, so on and so forth, right? So, and like I said, there's a variety of technologies here. Quinn kind of oversimplifies everything that's there. He talks about things like the ALL parental controls. Well, ALL is really not around anymore. But when they did have parental controls, it looked like this. Pretty basic. Um, you could slide some levers that would control the amount of content that they could get to. I'm not sure if it was create, uh, tied into content labels that they put on, or advisory labels they put on their own internal generated content, or this also applied to the internet and some of the early attempts at putting a rating system on the internet or what. They could set logs and you could set time limits and times of the day that your kiddos could get on there and access materials, right? So kind of limited use, but it happens today. There's router software that'll provide filters, and based on MAC addresses, you can limit the amount of time that your kid could be on a device. Obviously, kids can defeat that by getting software that would change MAC addresses and so on and so forth. But you know, it's better not doing anything, I guess. Um, so there's that. Now, obviously, there were some legislative acts. One of them was the Internet Child Internet Protection Act. Libraries receiving federal networking funds had to filter their pages for obscenities or child porn. And there were some court cases surrounding it and eventually reached the Supreme Court. And they basically ruled SIPA didn't violate the First Amendment guarantees. It was a 6-3 decision back in 03. And the government can basically require libraries to install anti-pornography filters and return to receive federal funds. A ACLU had argued in that case that it kept people from legitimate web pages. It created a burden anytime they needed a librarian to create an exception. That it could be embarrassing, right? Uh, for the person to ask for that exception, maybe that computer was the only way they had to access content. And even if that content was something we'd find objectionable, they should be able to access it. All right, and Rehnquist had wrote in that decision a public library does not require internet terminals in order to create a public forum for uh, web publishers to express themselves any more than uh, it collects books in order to provide a public forum by the, for the authors of books to speak, right? So they're not putting books in there the, so public authors can have a forum. So again, web publishers, you know, same thing here. The, because they collect certain types of web pages, I mean, all web publishers should have a forum to act, right? So... Most libraries exclude this content anyways because, well, that's upsetting the parents if, if Johnny can get to a website that they would find objectionable, right? Whether it's on purpose or by accident. So. 
And obviously you could apply various types of ethical analysis to this um, particular legislation act. Kantianism would find that it was wrong. Egalitarianism would look at it, well, it depends on how the benefits and harms are weighed. Social contract theory would say that freedom of conscience should be given preference in this case. Um, so it's, you know, generally speaking, not great. Um, the title on this slide is apparently missing, but it was sexting, I think it was, right? And basically sexting is sending s sexually suggested text messages or emails. I guess uh, you can extend it to that with nude or nearly nude photographs. And there was an 09 study on the prevalence of this among teenagers, all right? 9% sending a sext, 70% uh, receiving one. Um, your book gets in a few of these different court cases of different individuals. The first one there, Jesse Logan, he was obviously a teenager, a breakup. Um, I think he had sent pictures or something like that to other people in his social circles, got convicted of distributing child pornography or something like that. Um, Ting Yi had um, obviously had a situation where he was in a vice uh, principal with a student that had an image on the phone from a sexting incident, told him to keep it, um, just there on the phone for future reference or something like that. I, I, it was kind of weird. He eventually ended up getting arrested. He had to put up a second mortgage in the home and fight the court cases. It got, um, he got thrown out before it ever went to trial. Um, and so on and so forth. I forget the Philip Albert case without looking it back up. So, but there's some cases. They're they're interesting reads, and I encourage you to go back to them. All right, breaking trust. Um, obviously, identity theft is something that's occurred to a number of us. Um, obviously, your information. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways it can be taken. Right. I had as a government contractor my information leaked one time. I don't know to what extent that got used. Um, obviously every once in a while I get a new credit card in the mail and sometimes they're upfront about that it may have been compromised. Sometimes they just it's a new number and it wasn't anywhere close to expiration date of your credit card and it just it wasn't like there's new any capabilities so it was just like uh, we just want to be safe and send you a new credit card because we're not sure someone may have gotten a hold of it right so um so back in 2012 seven percent of adults reported being victims and, and generally speaking these cases are ones where people had new accounts opened in their name and people charged up a bunch of stuff and they kind of came back on them and they had to kind of take on like a part-time job to kind of clear all this stuff up and contact these companies saying no really it wasn't me my information was fraudulently used and um you know, I, I've had a few cases where I saw bogus charges on my credit cards, and I had to call in, and it was pretty straightforward. Um, got it cleared right off. You know, typically speaking, anything beyond fifty dollars that if you report it right away, it's typically um, not your responsibility. Most credit card companies have zero dollar liability. Do not use your uh, bank uh, debit cards, generally speaking, because those same protections don't extend there. I think that's still the case. Um, you know, you could be liable for whatever happens there. So, all right. So nearly half the cases come from lost credit cards or checkbooks, right? Basically people losing, you know, hold of their documents and people dumpster dive or shoulder surf and get that information, right? Sometimes in, uh, restaurants or other businesses, people carry portable skimmers or they'll be on gas station terminals, right? Um, sometimes they'd be pretty sophisticated. You, even I wouldn't be able to pick up that they're there, right? And um, they just grab your information and off to the races they go with it, right? So now college students are a lot more likely. You guys are a lot more likely to be victims. Um, I just really encourage, because you're using digital devices, you may not always secure your digital devices. I would encourage you to do so. Use a password management program that strongly encrypts your password files. Use really good password security. Use two-factor or multi-factor authentication on the websites whenever it's possible. Um, 
use authentication apps that provide one-time use codes as another form of protection, right? Um, you know, yes, it's inconvenient to do all those sorts of things. Um, also, yeah, shred all your financial documents when you get done. Or if you want to throw, instead of just throwing them out, shred them up. Make sure that you are not a tempting target. Um, keep your checkbook in a safe. Um, you know, it doesn't, you, yeah, someone could walk off with the safe, but you're just making it less likely, right? You're just trying to decrease um, crimes of opportunity. Um, so I'll move on from this. Um, obviously, phishing is another big way, right? You, someone sends an email trying to get you to click on a link, hopefully taking to a website that convincingly looks like your local bank or credit card company or PayPal or something else. Try to enter your credentials, they grab it, they go off with that, and then they try to start shutting you off from all the other accounts so they get a hold of your credentials to other places, and there you go again, right? So, so survey that your book referenced of North Americans 2014. Um, in terms of fake reviews, this is sort of the next topic they get into. We all depend on online reviews. For many years, I subscribed to Angie's List. Um, its value kind of decreased to me over the years. Um, um, so I, I, I don't use it anymore. But for a period of time, I found it useful to get reviews when I needed various services for the house. Um, obviously, there are issues with, with businesses leaving fake positive reviews or you know, uh, uh, for them, their own company, for their own businesses and leaving uh, negative fake reviews for their competitors. And companies like Angie's List or Yelp or whatever have to filter that stuff out. Um, I think nowadays you could use something like uh, the Nextdoor social network to get people's insights onto those sorts of things. And in some ways it's a little bit harder to police those, those sorts of efforts, right? So, all right. Obviously there's an issue of online predators. Um, especially, you know, again, this is a need to really carefully watch what your kids are doing online and always have conversations with them about safe internet behaviors and dangerous internet behaviors. Right? And it's in, it is incumbent upon you as a parent to really be aware of what your children are doing online. I can't stress enough, it is your responsibility. Um, it's no one else's responsibility, it is your responsibility as a parent to make sure your kids are, are safe online and they engage on, you know, with digital devices online. So, you know, the book talks about kick, right? And kick's still a thing, from what I can tell. I never um, did anything with it. I may have tried signing on once to see what it was like a few years back. Um, it got popular for a while, and then it got not popular, and there were some shenanigans with it, trying to do venture funding uh, efforts, particularly with uh, uh, their own created cryptocurrency and stuff, and it was just got weird. Um, but Kick also had this reputation of being a place for child predators, and where police, um, you know, they would have issues with trying to get information from Kick and stuff, and and it was just um, they just had issues. They just had issues with child exploitation and minors using the platform. Um, where adults were trying to take advantage of them, it was just not a good situation. So, and yes, I know that occurs on other platforms. I know Snapchat and Facebook Messenger is more popular nowadays, and the same sorts of people are on those platforms instead of maybe Kick now. And I know it's a cat and mouse game, but um, so again, it's why as a parent, you got to be aware of what your kids are doing. So. Right. And then obviously, a little the book kind of gets into this use. Uh, police stings to catch online predators, right? It was, you know, whether it was from Kick or Craigslist or um, um, some of these other services, I can't think off the head of my head. I, I don't think Craigslist has some of these advertising. I don't think they're those adult services anymore. Um, but there are some other ones too that were definitely meant for that, and uh, or other chat clients, right? And police would run these sting operations. You remember? catch a predator on NBC and that sort of stuff, right? Was it no ABC. It's one of those networks. And um you know and and they they run an episode and the guy come in and and Chris Hansen get on there and you know kind of just 
you know, on the air, shame the individual, right? Well, in some of these operations that were necessarily associated with catch a predator, right? Local police departments would run them and, and they would get people in legitimate ways that were pr um, prone to engaging in those activities, right? It wasn't like the police departments were engaging in entrapment, but there were some news stories out there and some, some sting operations, probably a small minority of them, like anything, um, where they got a little aggressive in, in their actions, where they were trying to say that they were an adult and then they weren't really an adult, or they're trying to steer the conversation back in a way that would put the person in legal jeopardy, right? So, and that sort of stuff was a no no because in any of these, in, the, in, the, in any of these ethical evaluations, you know, people were acting in ways, you know, with uh, Kantianism, would be that the police departments were using people as means and ends of keeping their. Con arresting rates up or you know utilitarian analysis you know would be you know, looking at yeah you're you're protecting the public and maybe only harming one person in one scenario so from that perspective it's good but you could also entrap other innocent folks and that's not good right social contract theory would be um you know it's um let's see here what did they say they didn't get into it. I didn't put slides in here for that. So, but I'll encourage you to go back and kind of read and look at the different perspectives. All right, false information. The web's full of it, right? We talk about fake news nowadays. This is after this book's edition was published, right? So the quality of the web varies quite widely. If it's on the web, it's got to be true, right? Well, not really. You know, we're long beyond the days where we had books and their publishers and they fact-checked it with many multiple sources. And I'm sure most of the news websites now, they still verify things from multiple sources. It's just good journalism. Um, but there's also a lot of websites out there and why some sites tend to, you know, run these news stories is it, you know, about the legitimacy of certain items. Um, you know, it's an issue. So again, just as a parent, you know, or as an educator, you have to teach students or kids how to responsibly evaluate the authenticity and the accuracy of information on various sources and how to cross-reference those sources and try to get as many different takes on a particular issue as you can to weed out the low quality information. Right. Another topic your book gets into is that of cyberbullying, right? And that's just basically use of the internet or the phone system to inflict psychological harm. What are examples? repeatedly texting or emailing the person, spreading lies about a person, tracking someone, um, or you know, tracking someone obviously in, in a very menacing way, uh, tricking someone into revealing highly personal information. Um, your book also mentions things like outing or, or doxing someone's, um, outing would be their secrets online, right? Like their their sexuality or something. Okay. Um, doxing would be um, disclosing their, their, their um, their place of residence or other sensitive uh, details about their daily um, going abouts or where they work versus their home, other things that would help someone actually figure out where someone is at a particular time, right? Um, uh, obviously posting embarrassing photographs or videos, impersonating someone else in order to damage that person's reputation, uh, threatening or creating significant fear, basically. Uh, and in repeated a pattern over a period of time, right? So that would be cyberbullying. And 2009 survey, your book talks about 10% admitted to it, 19% said they'd been cyberbullied, right? And there's a few cases in there, right? Um, that were just they're really sad. Uh, the the Megan Meyer situation led to an attempt by Congress to pass the Cyberbullying Prevention Act. Obviously, other folks thought that was not going to hold constitutional muster, so it kind of died um, within Congress. So. Another issue that's pretty big, right? Um, Ohio has passed a revenge porn law in the past few years. They have not passed a cyberbullying law of any sort, right? So that has been held up in committees. Um, for Ohio, I think that was House Bill 497 back in the 2018 legislative session. Um, but revenge porn, right, is just pretty much what it says. It's a special case of cyberbullying. It's just basically someone taking 
images or videos uh, two consenting individuals had exchanged at some point and when that relationship ends um, dis disseminating that information without the other party's expressed consent to do so and um, there have been and it's been criminalized to a large extent across a number of states even more so I think than when your book was published um, and a lot of you know private businesses publicly traded businesses right have policies against such things occurring and for good and, and that's good it's good to see this type of uh, developments that now these social media platforms have taken this issue very seriously and are going out of their way to try to prevent people from being harmed by the irresponsible actions of others right? so again you know my students particularly uh, the uh, to the ladies in 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 my courses you know just you know be very careful about what you share with someone um, you never know how it's going to end up being used even if even if this if someone does something that is illegal there's still a harm that can occur to you and I don't want to see you going through that now obviously as Christians we, we like to hold ourselves to a higher standard and 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 not engage in those sorts of things um, outside of the context of marriage right and it's very controversial about um, even inside of a marriage about about um, the use of such materials right so I'm not going to get into that type of debate here uh, in an introduction video so all right and then obviously the one thing we talked about recently and at least at the time that I recorded this video in the previous class was that of internet addiction with a particular emphasis on gaming addiction and our roles as software developers or future software developers or as IT um, administrative um, um, professionals in terms of gaming addictions, right? And how would we react to our, our involvement on, on, a, on, a, on a software development team to develop um, um, various forms of, of mechanics or mechanisms, right? To keep individuals within a particular game for longer and longer periods, right? So, so is internet addiction real? It's the first question to ask. A lot of people still doubt that it is, right? Um, you know, any. I guess there's a. Some people say that there's a, a difference between habitual activities and true addictions. Addictions. For a lot of people, and I guess psychologists would see it as something that rewires the brain, right? You get dopamine hits for doing certain activities, right? Over a period of time, you keep getting those dopamine hits. You, your brain pathways get rewired, and then you have to do more of that same thing to get the same level of a boost of, in terms of dopamine, right? Um, and you do it long enough, and I guess it becomes addictive, right? So is internet staying on the internet too long addictive is gaming too long addictive maybe could be right obviously if it harms yourself in other areas of your life it causes you to change your behaviors your interactions with others in a harmful way then there's a case to be made for it so obviously there's three variants of it there's the ex excessive gaming element that we talked about in, cl in, in class um, there's obviously sexual preoccupations. That's another component of it. And obviously there's the constant email or text messaging component. I would probably replace that with um, excessive use of social media or something along those lines. Nowadays, um, I guess email or text messaging could be a variant of it still, but I, I'd probably say social media more so. Um, just or mindless surfing on a, on a, on a device, I guess. Um, Four characteristics of, of internet addiction is excessive use, um, inability to withdraw yourself. Like it would be if a person couldn't withdraw themselves from the internet, like they went in on a, a week long trip, you know, into an area without access to digital devices, you know, would they kind of have a breakdown? If they would, that's probably not a good sign um, in terms of not being addicted to something. Um, tolerance, right? Do they need to be on a on a particular component of the internet longer and longer to get some sort of satisfaction from that? And obviously, are they neglecting their um, 
workplace responsibilities, their school responsibilities, their relationships with their family and their friends, that sort of thing. And then obviously, APA has looked at this um, over periods of time. So I'm not sure what the latest status of that is. Um, obviously, your book talks about a number of uh, stories out of South Korea where they had much um, higher levels of people using the internet and of using uh, various gaming platforms, right? Um, average high school student spends 23 hours per week gaming. Um, the Korean, South Korean government has passed laws to try to mitigate uh, excessive computer and game use, right? Such as children under 18 not being able to game from midnight to 6. Um, China discourages children from playing more than three hours per day in typical Chinese fashion of tracking everything. They kind of keep track on how many hours kids are on there, and then they require game manufacturer or game producers in, in China to assess penalties on excessive gameplay for those youngsters, right? And obviously, um, we talked a little bit about this in, in class and about groups like EA having what they like to refer to as surprise mechanics in their esports um, related titles, particularly the, the sports more oriented esports titles like the, the basketball and the football games and that sort of thing, right? And we talked a little bit about factors contributing to addiction in general. Um, talk about social groups and peer influences and situational factors or stress and lack of social support and intimacy and limited opportunities for uh, productive activity as, as contributing factors. Um, people have um, a fear of failure. They don't feel like they can achieve anything. No opportunities to do something that's more productive, right? So. Nothing wrong with gaming, nothing wrong with internet use, right? It's everything, it, you know, you do those things in moderation, and it's fine, right? It's only when it interferes with other things in your life that you really have to take stock of what you're doing, right? And, and try to create some balance. Right. So, you know, you know, there's um, the alignment view, and then there's the, the Jeffrey Raymond view, right? The alignment view is individuals can and should govern their life, and people are responsible for their own choices. Um, Raymond's view is that an addict's behavior makes sense if addict has no hope for a better future and society bears responsibility for helping people in the situations. So I think at this point I'm going to wrap this video up and uh, post it and you guys are free to utilize it to whatever extent you find it helpful. All right, Take care.